And this is Weaponized. Weaponized. Okay, so th this guy is kind of opening up to you. And as a journalist at this point in your career and, and going into digging into Bob Lazar's story and hearing this, this is the first time we start talking about a live, like an operator of these vehicles. So how did that, how did you feel when he, it's a guy telling you a story. How did that make you feel? This is no longer just about craft and propulsion, yeah. which is all that Bob was involved with. But he saw documents that they showed him. He did, Bob doesn't know if they're real or not real. He says, I didn't see that. I saw the propulsion system. But he read a bunch of shit. When, when O'Donnell says to you, Al O'Donnell, when he says to you, we had a live alien, a being, obviously from another world, what was your feeling? Well, I was overwhelmed because it was, in effect, confirmation of things that I had come to believe because of the reporting we'd already done. Uh, and then the evidence of cover-ups and lies that have been told to the public. Here's this guy in a high position with a high security clearance telling me that it was true, that they really did have a craft and they had a, a being. My second feeling was one of overwhelming sadness for the, uh, the being, whatever it was, you know, that was kept out there. I asked him, you know, what had happened to it? What became of it? He says, I don't know. I don't know what ever happened to it. But he was out there for a while, alive. And eventually they figured out a way to communicate with it. And so I asked him, well, what did it look like? And he made me guess, as he did with all these questions. He made me guess. He said, well, kind of looks like a, a certain political candidate. I said, well, who? What? A political candidate? Who? And at the time, Ross Perot was running for president. He said, it looks like Ross Perot, a little skinny guy with uh, big ears and a tiny head. Not a classic gray looking alien, uh, but a very odd looking uh, creature with really big ears that looked like Ross Perot. And I laughed. And so we had these conversations for a while, and I was blown away by the information they shared. I took all these notes. I, did, I was hoping that someday I might be able to get the information out. And I asked him, look, you're getting up there in age. Can you, if I can't record something with you, could you record a, a statement to the effect of tell me this story on camera, and then when, when you pass on, I could have the tape? And he said, yeah, he would do it. it you know, look, I've, I've heard a lot of wild stories that I can't verify a guy's telling you something and you get a sense as a journalist when you go down a road with somebody and you take your time and you vet it did you feel i mean is there any world where he's trying to fuck with you or is there a world where he's um trying to you know uh, dissuade get you know kind of put crazy information into your brain like what did you how did you feel when he was telling you this was it was he like straight with you? Like, explain that to me. Yeah, he was very straightforward. And again, this was not information he was giving up willingly. I mean, I had to really dig and coax and arm twist to get him to cough things up. And it was very slow going over about a two-year period, maybe a little bit longer. And I know that this, you always have to be wary of people with different agendas and people that just make stuff up. I didn't get that sense from him because of his standing in the community he had shared this story with members of his own family. And that's He'd, how, yeah. that's why they came to you is because they kind of give you a tip. And these members of his family, they, they're, um, I mean, they're serious people too. Yeah. So the, the one of his sons is an FBI agent, or was, he's passed on now. One of his sons was an FBI. One was an elected official. Elected official where? In Nevada. Okay. Yeah. That um, was the one that gave me the tip. But uh, so, so I just want to nail this in so I understand you were approached because he had shared this with his family privately, and then you had to kind of coax to get through to him about the story. Right. I think that's important because, look, these things don't happen. Like, people just come to us and say, you know, crazy stuff, and we're like, oh, yeah, cool, sounds good. Like, the dynamic of that socially as a journalist, like, getting in there, taking time, you know, we have to verify if what he said is true, and there, there are some major bombs coming about that, but it's like, that process is so important. So here you are, you're sitting with him. He tells you now they had a live ale and you felt sad because you're an animal rights activist. You, you love animals. I know with your cats at home and you do, you've done horse stories and all, you know, all the stories about like the uh, inhumane stuff to animals. So it made you personally sad. It makes me sad too now thinking about it. Yeah. But yeah. Well, we had these series of meetings and then the last time we met after he'd agreed to go ahead and record a tape and give it to me after he make an arrangement. So I got it after he passed on. He said that he'd been told to not talk to me anymore. He said okay. he'd been given a warning 
It was not a good idea for him to talk to me anymore about anything, not just that topic, but anything. Well, who knows that you're talking? Who would warn him? I, that I don't know. I don't know. But I, I, you recall back in those days, there was surveillance. We had our phones tapped at KLAS TV. There were guys following us around, me, Bob Lazar, Gene Huff, maybe oh, pe Robert Bigelow, people too. People were also coming to your news station, OSI, right. um, and they, they would come in and try to like get to you, and then they'd show you their card, and as if they put it down, they'd take it back, and you know your phones were tapped. So it's like, because of this story, all of a sudden you're on high alert. So anybody could have called him, been watching you, have meetings with the guy. But one, So what you're saying is one day it just he just said... I can't, I'm not allowed to talk to you anymore. Yeah, I've been told not to talk to you anymore. I've been told not to. That happened a lot to you during that time. How many witnesses came forward to verify Bob Lazar's story and then got shut down and tell me one? Yeah, a bunch of them. I mean, there were six right in a row that I spoke to on the phone who had agreed to meet with me and share the story, some of them on camera, who were visited the very next day, one after another. Because I had put out a I, I was uh, overt about it, asking people in the community. I know there are people out there listening to this TV broadcast who have information about this. Come on and tell us about it. Re yeah. Call me up. And several of them did. And one right after another, six in a row that called me and agreed to do an interview were visited the next day and told to, to shut the hell up. Okay, so how, how did that feel as a journalist? So I've had a similar experience where you're talking with somebody and all of a sudden they're told not to talk with you. By who is a mystery. And then... Do they threaten them? Yeah, they threatened them. So there was one, there was a cop that was a friend of mine. He's just passed on uh, as of last year, who was uh, an investigator, a police officer, and then later became a chief investigator for the district attorney's office, who worked at the county courthouse. After those stories came out in 1989, it's the, it's the talk of the town. It's uh, everyone's uh, buzzing about it. And he got into a conversation with the lady who worked as a clerk in the county court system. And she said, she shared a story with him that she had previously worked for a defense contractor named Holmes and Narver out at the test site and or on the Nellis Air Force Base range that she said and on meetings between high ranking Air Force officials and these defense contractors at which they discussed crashed saucers, recovered materials and what sounded like a Roswell type incident. And the security was so uh, strict that after she's taken notes in these meetings, they'd not only take the notes away from her, but they'd take the typewriter ribbon out of the typewriter and destroy it. Oh, so, so, that the, so the, it the ribbon on the typewriter didn't have the words yeah. printed on it. I've heard so about that. She, she told this story to this cop that I knew. He told me the story. I said, hey, do you think she talked to me? Well, yeah, she'd probably talk to you if you uh, kept her name out of it, kept her identity shielded. And I said, great. So I talked to her on the phone. A couple of days later, she agreed to meet with me and give me the whole rundown on this story. The very next day, she gets a knock on the door by these two agents who said that they represented uh, the, co the company that she had worked for, this defense contractor, and that she was still subject, they reminded her she's still subject to uh, uh, her, her security clearances and the conditions that, that she had agreed to. And they said this, we know that you travel to LA a lot to see your daughter and that she comes here. It's a big desert out there. We'd hate for anything to happen to either one of you, which she interpreted as a threat to her life. And I think that's a pretty fair interpretation. Holy she was scared. She, she was scared to death. And it was a decade later that I reached out to her again. She was still scared and wouldn't talk to me. A decade later, she's still scared and won't talk to you. So two questions. One is, is this female, is she still alive? No, she died two years oh, ago. Oh, man. Oh, okay. Now, th the second thing is, is, who was the contractor? Holmes and Narver was the name of the Holmes company. and Narver. Company. So they sent people who said, so people well, came we to her house yeah. physically who said they yeah. were from Holmes and Narver. Don't know if, yeah, don't know who they really and, were. And they did threaten what she felt was a threat to her life to talk to you about crashed UFOs and, and, the, the, and that happened to you a lot during that time. Well, six times right in a row within a three or four month period, um, there was a guy who was, he did taxes for... Air Force officials, and he got to know some of these guys really well, and they had told him a story about the Roswell crash. They were watching a TV show on some out-of-town trip and said, hey, that, that's real. And he wanted to tell me that story, and I said, great, I'll come over to see you tomorrow or the next day. In between my visit, uh, he was visited by two guys who said they're from the Secret Service, and they said, we understand you've been making threats against the life of the president. He said, what are you talking about? I never made such threats. Well, look, you can go to prison for this kind of thing. You might have keep your mouth, your mouth shut. You don't want to be flapping it, which he in, in, 
interpreted as being uh, a threat to him to keep shut quiet. It, it, it's it's clearly a threat. So the thing is, we don't know where these people are really coming from. Anybody, the people show me their badges all the time. Anybody can make a badge. So we don't know if that if they're actually from there. And then to say something out of left field, oh, we're secret service, you're making threats against the president. Like, obviously, this person was not doing nothing of the sort. This is UFO related. Someone is somehow knowing who you're talking with. We know your phones are tapped at KLAS, the news station, and they're silencing witnesses at right. this critical time of coming forward. It really pissed me off uh, because, you know, now we assume that people are listening to our phones and our conversations and monitoring email. All of us have that sort of back out of our head that it all goes into some giant supercomputer somewhere that, that nothing is truly private anymore. But back then, the idea that there are government entities, operatives, listening to the phone calls that come into a TV station. A news reporter, a That's journalist, an outrageous. investigative journalist. That is outrageous. That is that is spying on an American journalist and contacting sources and dissuading them through threats, physical harm, to not talk with you. <laughs>